All right, so let's, let's go to this uh, last presentation. Uh, thank you, Vicky, to be with us. Um, Vicky Young is an expert on the use of uh, US imaging for veterinary purposes, so I really look forward to her presentation because I think that um, maybe one direction we're going in uh, this translational perspective is really trying to translate the results of our basic research into large animals, also using uh, animals that naturally undergo disease as humans. And this perhaps could be a way to, re to better reproduce what we found in humans, so comorbidities, uh, uh, diseased aged animals and on animal models artificially implemented in young animals. And, um, and also reducing the number of uh, animals used for experimental research. So I think that uh, involving in the uh, scientific debates also people who work with uh, domestic animals and use the technology for diagnostic purposes could be one way to go and to really uh, improve our capacity to translate our results into the clinics. So Vicky, thank you again uh, to be here and we really look for your, your presentation. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. And I will get started with my slides. And here we go. Um, all right, well, thank you very much for the organizer for inviting me to give me this opportunity to share some of uh, our work with you. And also uh, many thanks to Diego for making the streaming work. So I'm a veterinary, I'm a veterinary cardiologist at Tufts University. And so the purpose of my talk is to uh, share with you what we do in our work and the potential of these animals in translational research. And just to give you an overview of some of the diseases that are common in these animals and, and have you figure out some potential to use these um, animals for your research work. So first of all, what do we mean by companion animals? They are the, the pets essentially that live in our homes, share our environment. So I'm focusing on cats and dogs, but of course companion animals can include rabbits, pocket pets, and some people even feel that horses are pets and they're not just um, farm animals. And our focus on cats and dog is um, important because they develop a lot of chronic diseases that are similar to people. They share the same, show the same type of clinical symptoms, the pathology, the genetic changes can be similar as well. The response to environment, response to medication are all very, very similar to human patients. And the theory is because evolutionarily cats and dogs have developed alongside of human, we've actually sort of uh, converged a little bit in our genetic uh, evolution. And there's a lot of similarity in genetic sequences between cats and dogs and humans, more so than between humans and rodents. And because of the large number of cats and dogs we have, it's really an underutilized resource for translational research. Just in the US alone, we have 70 million cats and 70 million dogs. And because of this large number, we have a large number of veterinarians who are very well-versed in diagnostics, uh, similar to what is done in human hospitals. And they're a portion of veterinarians are specialists that specialize in cardiology and different organs. So I, I do believe that this is an underutilized uh, resource for translational um, research. So pros and cons of using companion animals. The advantage is these are spontaneously, naturally occurring diseases. They are not man-made in a laboratory. These are animals that live in the same environment as human patients, so they share the same type of environmental risk, either smoking, secondhand smoking, obesity, um, not following exercise directions, all that kind of stuff. Medications, we use the same type of medication in humans, so they have the same type of effects and side effects and risk as well. Unlike laboratory animals, a lot of them are probably checked two, three times a day. These pets are constantly watched by their owners, and the owners are very well-tuned to their changes in quality of life and behavioral changes. 
And of course, instead of spending decades following um, these pets or these patients, these cats and dogs naturally live a lot shorter than humans, so we can shorten the duration of some of our clinical trials or research studies. Of course, some of these advantages do turn into disadvantages as well. Because these are naturally occurring diseases, they're complex. We have comorbidities. We have cats and dogs with heart disease with diabetes. So it's not as simple as rodent experiment, but that's also what makes it very realistic. Again, the environment, it's a little bit harder to control as in rodents and laboratories. Um, and not all owners are compliant. They may not give all the medication you want them to. They may not follow instructions. And euthanasia is something unique to the veterinary field. And this is a decision that um, owners make either based on quality of life or many times based on finances. So I don't think that companion animals can and will ever completely replace rodent models because rodent models are a lot simpler and easy to control. But before going jumping directly from rodent models to human patients, there has to be a checkpoint or something that it's a more realistic disease so that before spending millions of dollars into human clinical trials, there's something to help us decide whether or not it is worth taking that next step. So my focus today, of course, is with heart disease. And what I have shown here are four of the fairly common cat and dog heart diseases. Uh, Myxomatous mitral valve disease is a model for mitral valve prolapse. It's aging disease in dogs, and the histologic changes in the mitral valve is very similar to human mitral valve prolapse. There are changes to the microstructure of the, of the valve and collagen and elastin. Arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, or in people they call it uh, cardi uh, cardiodysplasia, is seen in boxer dogs, again, histologically, very similar to the changes seen in human ventricles. Dilate cardiomyopathy in large breed dogs, again, similar histologically. And then hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats, um, fairly high portion in cats will end up getting this disease. And again, changes are similar to humans. And you may notice here that what I'm showing are non-ischemic heart diseases. So fortunately or unfortunately, we really don't see that many coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease, I think it's more of a primate disease. So these animal models would be good for non-ischemic heart disease, but we don't have a cat or dog uh, disease for ischemic heart diseases. And just a brief look at all the other potential disease models, uh, besides the four I have just talked about, there are many congenital heart disease that happen in cats and dog as well, pain ductus arteriosus, pulmonic stenosis, tetralogy, tricuspid dysplasia, subaortic stenosis, and one of the things I do not have listed here is cardiac neoplasia. And one, the one, two of the more common ones we see are hemangiosarcoma and chemodectoma. And for most of these heart diseases, a specific breed is predisposed. Um, although many of them we'll see ones that are not falling into the breeds listed here show up with the same presentation as well, but we tend to be able to pick up on different breeds and most of their genetic causes are not known. Uh, but presentation of diseases are similar to human and potentially there are a lot of uh, uh, uses as translational models here. So I'm gonna start out with Part of the purpose of this talk is to show you that these ultrasonic or echocardiographic techniques are well established. It is done routinely in our patients. So starting a, a translational research in this area should not be difficult. And a lot of the standard views that we get for cats and dogs are the standard views for human patients. Uh, doing this exam, and the picture I have on the upper right is to show you that it's fairly easy to examine a cat or a dog. We don't usually don't do it with sedation. We have here a few veterinary students volunteering with gentle restraint of a cat. There is a hole underneath the cat on the table, and that's where the ultrasound probe comes out. 
we do the standard right lateral view and left lateral view. And on the right lateral view, again, we can get your standard right personal short axis view. Uh, this particular view is showing the left ventricle and right ventricle, but again, you can get the left atrium aortic view, mitral valve view, the apex of the left ventricle. You can also get the right peristonal long axis view, here showing the four chamber view with the right and left, uh, right and left ventricle and right and left atrium. We can also get the five chamber view with the aorta that shows up. So these are fairly, fairly standard imaging techniques. Again, we do the standard uh, imaging as in human patients. We do MOs, uh, 2D measurements. Uh, MOs we use to measure left ventricular, septal, and free wall thicknesses, uh, cardiac chamber, and systole and diastole. And these are, I'll show you a little bit how we use these measurements a little bit later. Another important view for us is to get the aorta and left atrial measurement. This view is important for us because we use the left atrial size to track disease progression. And as the animal gets closer and closer to heart failure, the left atrial size gets bigger and bigger, and I think similar to human patients. You may be thinking to yourself, well, which size dog do you pick to do your research? And of course, this is a, a big problem or problem we have to overcome in our canine patients when their size is vary so much. Clinically, we, we do normalization of measurements routinely uh, because of this issue, and these are well-established numbers out there. So this research in natural occurring diseases and their, uh, patients of different sizes are very much feasible. So what is shown here is we generally normalize our uh, M-mode indices by weight to a constant, which is shown here in exponent. And so this proportionality constant A that we get out of this calculation has to fall within this 95 percentile uh, measurement shown in the table for normal animals. And all of these stuff we actually, for our uh, clinic, we have this uh, automatically programmed to our echocardiographic machine and it just uh, pumps out a, whether or not our patient falls within this normal. So the size of the dog is not an issue for us. And all of these information are out there and easily uh, searchable. Again, left atrial to aortic size is an important, important indice for us. Uh, fractional shortening is also important because these are ratios. We do not need to normalize by body weight. And again, normal values are out there. So uh, we can easily decide whether or not our patient has any problems. So the, besides right lateral view, we also obtain the left lateral view. And example is down here, which is the apical four chamber view. Um, the left side of the heart here, left ventricle, left atrium, mitral valve, you can see this is a dog with mitral valve disease. And the importance of this view for us, and I think in this seminar, um, many speakers have already talked about diastolic dysfunction. This is one of the images that we also try to evaluate our patient's diastolic function with a mitral or tricuspid inflow. And these, again, are, are common views you see in human patients, the E wave, the A wave, E prime, A prime on tissue Doppler. And we'll touch on a little bit of these more in detail. So for the rest of my talk, what I want to do is um, give an overview of the four major cat and dog heart diseases and talk about some of the additional echocardiographic testing we do for some of these uh, particular heart disease. So we'll start out with canine dilated cardiomyopathy. For the example I have here, the right peristonal short axis view and right peristonal long axis view, I don't think it's hard to appreciate that this is an animal with decreased contractile function, the thinning of the left ventricular wall, dilation of the cavities. So MO will, if we cannot subjectively pick it out, MO is another way of helping us actually do measurements and get the fractional shortening number. Because fractional shortening is the estimation of a 2D number, and 
on with early cardiomyopathy for a lot of these animals we can't easily pick up changes in the number comparing to the normals that are established that I've shown you earlier so this is a commonly used human technique which is Simpson's method of disc for us it's still relatively new and I believe in in human patients they use um, left apical four and two chamber view to do biplane analysis the two chamber view in dogs especially for the deep chested dog is actually not the easiest view to get so there's a study out there that showed that we can still easily get accurate numbers using the right peristernal long axis view which is shown sorry right up here and get a more of a 3d estimation an ejection fraction out of these animals and pick up occult or early dilated cardiomyopathy because this is a relatively new technique for us we don't have a set of normals established by weight but there are people doing specific research in doberman boxers irish wolfhound that have set breed standards. And what I have here is an example of a, a reference value for Dobermans. And I do believe that more and more of these values will be published as people who are, have specific breed interest and for dogs that are predisposed to dilated cardiomyopathy will start uh, publishing numbers such as this one. Arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia or cardiomyopathy is a dog that we often see in boxer dogs or English bulldogs. They show up first with uh, electrocardiographic changes without any cardi echocardiographic changes, at least subjectively with the traditional uh, ways of characterizing them. So one method that we would, for predisposed breed, we would do additional tests called the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, also modified from uh, human studies, uh, TAPC. And essentially, because this disease tend to affect the right side of the heart first before affecting the left side, what we try to do is measure the movement of the tricuspid annulus in this region. And what we measure is the motion difference at the, of the annulus between systole and diastole and then refer it to set of normals established for dogs of various weight to see if they're normal and if they're not, then we do additional testing, halter testing to try really try to investigate whether or not the animal is affected by ARVC. So that is a fairly common technique we use. And then for cats, they are pre, a lot of them are predisposed to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The advantage of doing CAS study is the size does not vary nearly as much as the dog patients. So there are more detailed normal values uh, published out there, but we generally say, well, left ventricular, while either focal or diffusely should not go over 0.6 centimeters, and that's a standard for us. And you can see this example here. Uh, it's uh, pretty obvious that the LV walls are thickened. There are prominent papillary muscles and the basilar region of the septum here is quite thick and some of these animals will develop obstruction to the flow into the aorta. Again, HCM is a disease of diastolic dysfunction. That's why these cats, we will additionally do the mitral inflow uh, measurements, measuring E and A wave, IVRT, and the tissue Doppler measurements, E prime, A prime. And again, these normal values are all established. So doing these studies are not difficult to reference it back to where your particular patient stands. And um, a lot of this information can be found. And finally, sort of my personal interest is the myxomatous mitral valve disease, which is a model for mitral valve prolapse in humans. And these affect um, a lot of the small breed dogs. And you can see here on the right lateral uh, long axis view, parasomal long axis view, the left ventricle, left atrium, and the right side of heart here, mitral valve in the middle, uh, obvious prolapsing of the mitral valve, all the cavities are dilated. And tissue dop um, Doppler for us, you can see the mitral regurgitation, uh, pretty significant for this particular patient. We generally subjectively grade them 
uh, one, two, three, based on how much the regurgitation is filling the left atrial wall, uh, left atrial chamber. But more objective techniques can be used as well, which is, again, modified from human techniques, such as the proximal isovelocity surface area, which will help you estimate the mitral regurgitation volume. And again, the left atrial aortic ratio is fairly important for us to have an idea how big this left atrium is and how close or if we're consistent with the patient in active heart failure. So I am actually going to share some of the additional work that we've been working on with the mitral valve disease in dogs. Um, just give you sort of why we're so interested in this is it, on clinics, two-thirds of our patients come in with mitral valve disease, and uh, they end up with very severe mitral regurgitation, cardiac remodeling, they're in heart failure, and it's really devastating to our owners and our patient that once they're in heart failure, they really only have about one to nine months of survival time left. And here's an example of one of these mitral valve, and this is the severe cases where it's not just prolapsing, but there's fibrosis changes in the collagen lasting structure that essentially the valves are just nodules that there is no way they can cover up this annulus space. For people, there are many people with mitral valve prolapse will go on not being affected, but a subset of them will require valve replacement or repair. And surgery, especially for the elderly, it can be kind of risky. And medical management essentially doesn't do anything for people. This is the same case for dogs. Really, medical management is just make sure they feel comfortable with heart failure. We're not changing the course of the disease. So surgery, it's not really not an option cost-wise, and we just don't have enough surgeons um, in the U.S. to be able to do this um, surgery successfully. So what we are then thinking is, again, I think a lot of focus on the seminar right now has been microRNA, and that's one of our um, interests as well, is are there exosomal microRNA that can, we can use as biomarkers to pick up these dogs that are affected by the disease sooner? And then think about, is there any therapeutic target in terms of these non-coding RNA that we can use to either delay uh, the disease process or at least make it easier for us to control their heart failure signs. So for our study, we actually recruited normal client patients and uh, divided it into four groups because this, this is our pilot study. Uh, because this is a age-related disease, we wanted to look at the effect of age as well. So we have a group of young normal dogs, old normal dogs, dogs with mitral valve disease before going to heart failure and those who are already in active heart failure. And we, because the, these dogs are regular patients, they come with other disease processes. So we had to exclude animals with cancer, animals with diabetes or other metabolic diseases um, or severe pulmonary hypertension or uncontrollable hypothyroidism. So, there are um, microRNA arrays avail commercially available out there. The one we used was a Kaijin array that can detect 277 canine-specific uh, microRNAs. With analysis of our data, we actually uh, picked up four particular microRNAs, microRNA 9181C495599, that seems to differ between one group or another um, and further look at this data is actually fairly interesting for us. And um, we'll start with microRNA9, which it's, has been published to have anti-fibrotic effects. And we see a change going from the old normal dog to dogs with mitral valve disease. So whether or not um, a decrease in, oh, let me clarify this, these are CT numbers from qPCR. So the lower the number means the higher the expression. So here we actually see that with disease, there's actually an increase in microRNA9 expression, whether or not this is response of the body uh, to, to want to 
counter the effects of the disease. And again, I need to emphasize these are plasma exosomal microRNA. So we do not know where these exosomes are coming from. It could be from coming from the heart. It could be coming from different parts of the body. So that's sort of one of the limitations of our study. 181C, which has been associated with mitochondrial dysfunction, reactive oxygenase production, we see an increase in it with the development of heart failure. So is it that with heart failure, uh, there is actually, again, this is um, us um, guessing if this is happening in the cardiomyocytes, the cardiomyocytes are now having mitro mitochondrial dysfunction, increased ROS production, further uh, affecting the function of the heart. 495, it has been associated with cardiomyocyte proliferation, and you see an increased number in the young animals and also the animals with heart failure. So we can logically think of young animals, um, perhaps they still have a drive for cardiomyocyte proliferation, whether or not it's a successful division of the cardiomyocyte would be a different story. Uh, for heart failure dogs, we often see hypertrophy, whether or not this is also a response to the microRNA. And microRNA 599 is one of those that I haven't quite figured out how it fits in our story uh, when it's high in our old normal animals. Um, it's been known to decrease the production of collagen. So these are our preliminary data. We still have to validate it with a much larger sample set and also to figure out, well, where exactly are these microRNAs coming from? Are they coming from the heart or different part of the organ that's been affected with decreased cardio, cardiac output because of the heart disease? We've sort of looked into gene targets of these uh, four microRNA. Three of them have common targets. And just as an interest, point out that there are common targets that are involved in fibrosis, uh, either by increasing or decreasing it, um, cardiac uh, calcium homeostasis, which is important for heart function, a cardiac myocyte cell cycling, and mitochondrial RNA stability. So we've sort of touched on the surface of this and still have a lot of interesting work to do. But this is an example for you to see that there are potentials in companion animals as translation models. Can we then use the information we find in dogs with heart failure and then go in and study if these changes are similar in our human patients? Of course, to have a good model, it's not just having the imaging technique. There are other complementary uh, diagnostics that we need to have. And one good thing about having seeing cat and dog patients in our veterinary field that there are biomarkers that are well established for them. And T pro BMP is well established for cats and dogs and we use it regularly for our clinical purposes. Cardiac troponin I, again, is well often used in a clinical setting. And depending on um, the location or the hospital you're in, your other imaging modalities are available. Transesophageal echocardiogram, is often used. Um, these animals are big enough, the transesophageal probe will fit into our cats and dogs. 3D echocardiogram, we've just started using it. We're testing around and trying to figure out the utility of it. ECG gated MRI, like what the previous um, speaker has been talking about, there are uh, hospitals with this type of facility, and CT is pretty standard for most veterinary hospitals to look at pericardial structure, neoplasia, and then some vascular abnormalities. So I just want to finish my talk by um, acknowledging the people in our laboratory who's been contributing a lot to our studies here, and I'll be opening up for any questions.